Hey everybody, it's me, it's your old buddy, Steve Simonson, and I'm coming back with another Awesomers.com podcast episode. Now in this long running series, uh, we are now at 166. So for the uninitiated, uh, those pros that already know what to do, you just go to Awesomers.com slash 166 and you'll be able to see today's show notes, details. I may throw in a link or two. Uh, and occasionally I will uh, put some bonus content videos or whatnot there as well. So awesomers.com 166, that's where you go uh, to find out the inside scoop about what we're talking about today. And I'm pleased uh, today to introduce you to Mayan Gordon. Mayan, say hello. Hey guys, how's it going? That's, uh, Mayan, everybody, is an expert in social media, particularly in TikTok. And we're going to dive deep into that. Uh, but Mayan, uh, everybody cares about numbers, right? Uh, my TikTok followers, probably due to the fact that I don't have the app installed, are zero. Well, <laughs> how many TikTok followers you got? I've got 1.7 million. All right. So for those keeping score at home, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of followers. Um, I always describe followers uh, as a relative thing. Uh, if you have four people following you on Instagram, not so impressive. If you have four people following you down a dark alleyway, that's too many. That's a lot of followers. So you got to be careful. Um, Mayan, tell us a little bit about kind of how you got your start. Let, let's learn a little bit about your, your origin story a little bit. So before you had 1.7 million people on TikTok who follow you, what were you doing and where did you come from? Yeah, so I think I, like a lot of young people, was a little bit of a lost soul um, in my, you know, late teens, early 20s, as they say. Oh, it makes me feel so young. <laughs> um, <laughs> makes me feel old. Thanks and, for the help. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was, I was in college with a, a chemistry, you know, major track. Um, so I was taking all my basic classes of, you know, physics, calculus, um, you know, chemistry, things like that. And after a year and a half of it, I realized I just wasn't enjoying it um, the way that I felt I should be enjoying whatever it was that I was going to pursue. Uh, so at that point, I had an early life crisis, <laughs> and I dropped out of college, um, very just kind of on, on a whim. Um, I didn't even take that long to think about it, probably two weeks, um, and I decided. I was like, yeah, there's no way I can see myself doing this like in the future. Um, and at the time, I was freelance writing and getting gigs off Craigslist mostly for all, all types of writing jobs, from writing a blog post for, you know, $10, $15 to writing, uh, you know, longer articles for, you know, $50 and $100 plus. And I got hired on kind of a regular basis, even though it was freelance work, by a particular internet marketer whose name was Jamie Lewis. And he had... I was able to really learn a lot about... Um, internet marketing in all the various aspects where it existed. So at the time, it was affiliate marketing, um, email marketing, and content marketing were kind of the, the three main ones, and SEO would fall under kind of content marketing. Um, so I did that for a while, and then I, I met my boyfriend and husband now, um, and I wanted to start up a business kind of together. Um, I've always had ambitions of growing things and creating, and I've been fascinated with how businesses work from kind of an early age. And so we, we came up with a product idea, which was called 2K Diffuser Beads. And we basically bought Airsoft BBs, uh, colorful ones. So they were like red, green, yellow. Uh, one, one set was glow in the dark, so that was a really big deal. Um, and we repackaged them into jars and sold them to smoke shops and to stoners through our website to put into their bongs. <laughs> so, wow. You know, that is a yeah. niche item right there. Okay, that is crazy. Super niche. It literally doesn't get more niche than that, yeah. It, and it was a product that didn't exist yet on really any level. So when we were calling up um, smoke shops and dealing with kind of wholesale, trying to get wholesale orders, we had to completely explain what we were even talking about. You know, we'd say, hey, this is, you know, my own with 2K diffuser beads. Would you guys like to try out some diffuser beads in your shop? And they would go, what are diffuser beads? <laughs> and so that was such a great, you know, um, head first dive into marketing because I had to market something essentially from the ground up where people had no idea what it was. Um, I had to not only educate them, but get them interested and explain all the benefits of why, you know, they should buy the product or try the product. Um, and from there that worked really well. We did, I think like 70,000 our first year in sales. And the next year we did about 130 in sales. So for one little product, that's just plastic. It was amazing. Um, but it was a lot of work you know, taking the beads and putting them in all these jars because it was a low 
price product. So, you know, it was $10 retail wholesale. We're selling at four to $5. So our orders were like thousands of jars that we had to fill, put the labels on, like do everything for. And after a while we got pretty burnt out and went, we don't want to fill diffuser read jars the rest of our life. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that's a surprise ending right there. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of kind of margin or enough margin in there for us to think really about hiring someone to do all the work for us and have it still be um, something that made enough money to pay our bills and kind of, you know, have a nice living. So I started looking at what other um, resources and options I had at the time. We hadn't like saved up any money um, again, because our, even though we did 70,000 and 130,000 in sales, um, our profit on that was much, much lower. Um, so it mostly all went to, you know, rent and food and, we have four dogs, so that takes up a lot of a lot of our cash flow. <laughs> yeah, those uh, pesky uh, canines—they're uh, a big uh, dogs to the layperson. They yeah, are, uh, a big. Uh, well, really, any living expense really adds up. And so, first of all, I I want to just salute you. But it is awesome that you just kind of took this idea. I, I've never heard of a diffuser bead. Maybe that's a term you made up yourself. But I love the idea of the marketing and and you had a very clear target uh, in terms of who you wanted to sell to. Did you sell yes. direct online as well or just wholesale? We did both. Yeah. So I've always, with every business that I've ever kind of been involved with, I've always done both um, wholesale and direct to customer retail. Uh, because I've been strong with branding, it's, it's never made sense for me to just do wholesale. Um, it's always better margins. You build up a better brand reputation, kind of just a better um, sustainability for your business, being able to go direct to retail. But wholesale is always larger volumes of money. Um, so that's something that, you know, with the, a low price product, it's really helpful to have some kind of bigger wholesale orders you can rely on. Um, but yeah, we, we had a website that we sold wholesale and then for a or, uh, retail and for a good while, we also did Amazon um, mm -hmm. until they, until, cause again, they didn't know what it was, but eventually they figured out it was a smoking related product and pretty much every platform that exists online in a large capacity is completely anti anything even to do with tobacco um, because it's considered high risk for them. So, you know, we got taken off Amazon and when that happened, that's like really when we were like, okay, let's figure out something else. Like this isn't going to grow at a mass scale. So um, that's when I hopped into doing graphic design and printing up stickers and t-shirts for all sorts of different businesses. Um, for the first, I say six months to a year, it was really random. Um, I was getting kind of jobs from Craigslist. I was posting in, in the jobs and services section. Um, in the gig section and, you know, doing things like car decals for, um, you know, mechanic businesses or, you know, designing a logo for um, a floral company, just really random little things until um, I got hired by a glass artist. <laughs> and here's where it, it turns into glass blind. Um, and he really loved my work and kind of the service that I provided. And he told all his glass blower friends. And the way it works, I think, in a lot of artist communities is when you're an artist, almost all of your close friends are other artists as well. Um, and so I just got all of a sudden a bunch of different glass artists who all wanted stickers and logos and these different designs. And so I started making, you know, all these cool glass blowing designs for them. And that really started to pique my interest into this whole world of glass blowing. And <clears throat> after a while, I... I saw that there was enough market where I could kind of reach out to other glass artists and say, hey, would you like some stickers instead of just relying on the referrals? And half of them got back to me and would say, I would love some stickers. In fact, I need stickers, but I just don't have cash for, you know, spending on marketing right now. Um, I've got all this glass sitting around. I need to sell it first. And so my, my brain worked and it went, oh, well, why don't you just trade me the glass piece? I'll take I'll take extra glass, send me $400 in glass instead of $100 in cash, and we'll call it good. And it worked out that way really well because to them to send $400 in glass was actually less than sending over $100 cash because they were making the pieces. Um, and then they got something really that they wanted and needed out of it. So that's how I really got into glass blowing was I started accumulating all these glass pieces and I started selling them. And it opened up my mind to see, oh, there's a real business opportunity here with selling glass pieces. And at the time, it was just, again, perfect timing for me to get into the market where there was incredibly high demand and a lot less supply than could meet the demand. So um, after a while, I traded a lesson, a one-on-one -on -one lesson for a set of stickers. And um, 
fell in love with it kind of right away, figured that it was something I, I'd really enjoyed doing on a daily basis. And I made a hard switch to glass blowing. So I pretty much stopped almost all of my graphic design, except for people who were still kind of hitting me up from referrals. Um, and every day I would spend between like eight and 16 hours blowing glass, making pieces. Um, wow, boy, uh, Chihuly better watch his back. Uh, <laughs> hard charger for him. So, uh, so how did the, I, I'm fascinated by this idea. So you're into the glass blowing and it's, it's obviously something you have a passion for. It must have an artistic soul and so forth. How did that get into any kind of social media stuff? Yeah, so I'd always been on Instagram. That's how I, I got into social media in a business aspect with Instagram. I'd been on Facebook for, you know, however long I can remember. <laughs> um, but it always been, Facebook had, had always been mostly um, about, you know, friends and family kind of posting things that we're doing and kind of keeping in touch. Um, and Instagram was the first social media platform that I really looked at in a business aspect. And we built up um, quite a good following with our 2K diffuser beat business, with our um, smoking product. And for us, that was a really, really useful tool to send um, businesses to, to look at what our product looked like and to prove to them that there was interest from customers and from their customers. Because um, they could literally go on our post and see all these comments being like, oh, those look so dope, I wanna try some out. Um, and oftentimes, <laughs> that, that seems like an exact precise quote of what the target audience would say. <laughs> yeah, I, I speak stoner very well. <laughs> yeah, right? it was very authentic, good. Yeah. Um, and so, I kind of, when I switched to graphic design, I just flipped those accounts. I just changed the account names. I kept all the same, um, you know, followers, lost some of the following who maybe was only interested in um, the 2K diffuser beads. But in general, the way I've always run my social media accounts is to build enough interest around myself and um, the business behind whatever the business is producing, like the product or service, to where people are curious where it's going next and they kind of want to continue to follow along, even if it completely flips or switches. So as soon as I started posting, um, you know, my graphic designs and my logos, people were really interested in that as well because it was just kind of another thing for them to follow along with. Um, and people are, are always interested in new things. Um, I think much less and less people care about what you've done before, as long as what you're doing now is still interesting. Um, so, you know, I turned it into the graphic design um, kind of page. And then when I got into glass blowing, I was like, oh, these are actually even more connected. Graphic design is just a digital form of artwork. Glass blowing is a more physical form of artwork. And so it was very easy for me to transition into showing people my logos to showing people my art pieces to kind of build up interest. I like that. So, uh, first of all, for the Austin's out there listening, you know, uh, Maya just described kind of the idea of big picture branding, right? And and that's the underpinnings of what what she's talked about. But she also talked about this idea of what what I call the the company origin story, right? There's people follow the company because they care about the company or the people behind the company. That they, they find some sort of affinity that it goes beyond just a transactional. I need an iPhone case. Uh, let me buy this and forget all about the, the transaction. And for the Osmers who haven't joined the mailing list, you go to Osmers.com, find a button. There's join the movement or join the whatever. And we will send you a bunch of free stuff for the first uh, eight weeks. We, we never actually charge anything on Osmers. It's, it's we have like eight weeks of content, including how to write your company story. And Mayan is like writing her company story right in front of us, right? She's telling us how she got started. And that's what creates affinity. That's ultimately what creates a good brand. So kudos to you. Uh, even if you weren't engineering that outcome, that's what's happening. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so you probably knew that from your big picture marketing and kind of putting the whole thing together, huh? You know, actually, I would say no. It most definitely happened um, unintentionally. Um, and it happened because I've just always been really focused on opportunity and I've always been really impatient. <laughs> so, ah, yes. um, which I, you know, in a good way, impatient in a good way. So I've always been someone who's patient in terms of seeing if something's going to play out, but impatient in terms of letting that be the only thing that I'm kind of counting on or relying on. So as, you know, things were starting to do well with first the diffuser beads and then the graphic design um, and then the glass blowing, I really wasn't thinking about, you know, what, what else can I add or how can I make the story more interesting? I was just thinking, okay, I've got this mo level of momentum. How can I amplify that? How can I, one, you know, prevent it from uh, dissipating? Because momentum something, it's, it's very finicky. Um, it can very easily go away. 
but if you, you know, tap it in just the right ways, it can really build in an amazing way. And so I've always been kind of trying to figure out with the limited resources that I've had in the past, how I can tap into and amplify the momentum that I've created. And that's where really it all kind of all these different turns have stemmed from. Yeah, I definitely, even if it's organic, it's the instinct is there. And by the way, many entrepreneurs, uh, I would say the vast majority, if I'm being honest, have that same sense of impatience, right? It's, it's not a question of us uh, having short tempers. It's a question of us like more faster, cheaper go, you know, right? Yeah, and and yeah. we're always just a kind of, that's a, a common motivation. And I agree with you. Momentum actually is a really big, important part to uh, entrepreneurs as well. So so once you kind of got into this glass blowing and, and you know, you already had kind of your, your Facebook and your Instagram, how, how, where did the transition start happening or at least the augmentation of uh, TikTok come in? So not till quite a lot later. Um, I was on Instagram, you know, in Facebook kind of as my sole uh, platforms for four years. And it wasn't until really six months ago that I jumped over to TikTok. And again, it was um, not because necessarily I felt that Instagram wasn't working at all anymore, but it wasn't working as fast or build, continuing to build momentum the way that I think uh, when you're building a social following, that's what you want. That's what you're aiming for is to not only have a steady increase of followers, but really at some point for it to take kind of an exponential turn and for you to you know, explode in popularity. Um, and that was definitely not going to happen with Instagram, the way that Instagram was changing up its algorithm. Um, there's still definitely ways to do that on Instagram, but not in the way that I want to kind of organically grow. Um, and so I, I started looking at other platforms that might be available. TikTok was one of them. Another one that I was trying out was something called Patreon, which is a membership style website where you post videos and people pay, you know, like one to five dollars per month to get kind of get access to, to these videos and other information. Um, and I was just kind of testing waters to see what are, what are the new things that are out there? You know, I've been on Instagram for, for years without really deep diving into anything else. Um, and in that amount of time, things really have, have changed a lot in terms of technology. Um, just, you know, another one would be LinkedIn. So I'd been on LinkedIn or had an account um, from like an old email address from, from when I was in college. So almost 10 years ago. Um, and back, back then LinkedIn was essentially like a black book. You could just see people's information, but there was no real, um, you know, posting. It was not like Facebook style the way it is now where there was posting and all this interaction. And so I, I looked back at LinkedIn as well. And I was like, oh, wow, this platform's developed amazingly. Um, and so I started paying more attention to kind of what was out there. And it just happened that TikTok exploded for me. And then I started to put more focus on it and kind of, you know, put my energy into the thing that was working out best for me. Yeah, I love it. And uh, I think uh, LinkedIn is where I discovered you, uh, obviously, because uh, I'm not on TikTok. That's uh, <laughs> uh, subject to change, by the way. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm certainly not the target audience. We'll talk about some of the TikTok dynamics here uh, coming up. But so I found you on LinkedIn. And obviously, you know, the, the, the very eclectic, you know, copywriter, influencer, glassblower, <laughs> uh, 1.7 million followers. It's like, this is crazy. Uh, and uh, the fact is, I don't understand why people use TikTok. Like, maybe you can, so anybody who's 25 and under, you get it, fine. Uh, you can uh, laugh at me uh, during this time. But anybody who's above 25, there's a good chance that you haven't used TikTok or that you don't know why people use it. Tell me, uh, in your best uh, guess, uh, Mayan, what, what you think is the purpose of people using the app. Yeah, so I would say the number one reason people are on the app for, for at all is because it makes them happy. It makes them feel good. The same way you would watch TV. It's, it's really similar to TV and how everyone used to really, really heavily consume television as their like main activity. Um, and now instead of watching TV where you have to flip through and pick channels, you open up TikTok and it is literally feeding you videos that it knows you're going to enjoy. So, you know, instead of going on YouTube, right, YouTube is, I'd say, the number one popular kind of entertainment, um, just enjoyable app at the moment, besides maybe TikTok coming up on it. Um, people go to YouTube, right, to just relax, to instead of watching TV, pick something they're interested in and have a good time. And TikTok is delivering that really effectively in like 10, 15 second punches to the face of happiness. <laughs> so that, that's why people are on it. They might be having a bad day. They might be bored. 
um, and they're hopping on TikTok to kind of fill that emotional uh, cavity. Yeah, I think that's probably a very uh, salient point. So uh, for those keeping score at home, uh, TikTok has a massive amount of users. Uh, as of the beginning of 2019, it was something like 500 million active users a day, according to a leaked internal TikTok thing in the third quarter of 2019, they're up to 800 million actives a day. Uh, there are a bunch of foreign, um, uh, I don't know, user groups, right? Uh, China's got a massive user group. Uh, India's got a massive user group. Making the United States somewhere around 20%, uh, maybe a little bit less of uh, TikTok users. Do you know, maybe it might even be only 10 all, Yeah, I think it's like 10, I think there's about 30 million, um, 30 to 40 million in the U.S., um, yeah, so I think that's I think that's about right. Although hard charging, you talked about that inflection point, the old hockey stick, right? right? It was kind of flat, 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 and now it's jumping up. In particular, with adults, uh, adults, uh, those uh, you know, let's say whatever it is, twenty four and up, are joining at a much faster clip because the Gen Z was already there. Yeah. Uh, millennials are then joining, and uh, it's possible that you know old people, uh, Gen X, and and so on may may join the party. I did have the opportunity to watch somebody in Times Square. I was just in New York and they were sitting next to me. I was just out there waiting for uh, somebody. And, and I just, I, I assume it was TikTok because they were literally just watching five to 10 second clips of people doing various things. And, and boy, it really struck me as like the attention span is extraordinarily short, right? Yeah. You got 10 or 15 seconds and, and then you're done. So the ultimate question for e-commerce entrepreneurs, Amazon sellers in general is, how in the world do you make this giant audience, right? So we, we now see a herd over here and we're like, how do we sell something to that herd? You know, so how do you make TikTok into something that is usable as a business? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's a couple ways. There's really two things to look at when looking at it for business. One is what can it do right this absolute second? And two, what do we think it's going to be able to do in six months, one year, two years? Uh, because as you know, being an early adopter to something that's really turns mega has an insane amount of value, even when you can't tap into that value right away. So if you're talking about what it can do right now for your business, it can really generate buzz and create an interest on a level that never possibly even existed for your business. So for me, uh, I'm a great example of that. Um, the amount of people who, would, who are actually interested in my glass blowing business is far fewer than the number of people who are interested in the fact that I got 1.7 million followers for my glass blowing business. So it's, it's not necessarily even the, how the attention converts very directly in an ROI, like the customer sees it and is buying something. That's a direct ROI conversion. But if the, enough customers see it and then they tell someone who is now paying attention to it, who works at a high company that I might want to do business with, the fact that they have heard of my brand or business for organically through their channels versus me advertising to them gives me such a bigger chance of doing business with them, especially if I'm kind of at, at the bottom uh, competitively in terms of resources in my industry. So for me, you know, I don't have a, a bankroll of millions of dollars to tap from. I don't have tons of connections built up yet that I can really ask favors from. Um, there's lots of different resources businesses have, and if you have less resources, attention can be absolutely one of the best leverageable assets that you can create for yourself. Yeah, without a doubt. I think that's, uh, again, well, well said because it's not a question of what can you get today, right? Uh, there, there are channels, right? You go on to AdWords, you're like, I'm putting money in this keyword, yeah. I want the sale tomorrow, Great and conversion. I'll spend it again yeah. the next day. It, it's very kind of direct ROI particularly this you're you're kind of leaning into the future and I, I respect the yes. fact that you were able to think of that and and to figure out how to build an audience uh, around the glass blowing which again I don't think anybody has the expectation in fact I would I would suppose that you're not placing buy this glass on your TikTok you're doing some other kind of brand building can you talk about that a little bit yeah absolutely so it TikTok's an interesting digital environment where um, it favors again it favors content that is pleasing even over content that has um, like a lot of humor or like that normally objectively looking at you would go, that's better content because it's, it's funnier, it's like more surprising. People when they're on the app, they just wanna feel at ease and they wanna feel relaxed and they wanna feel happy. Um, so a lot of my content falls into a category called oddly satisfying. 
um, <laughs> where it's basically tapping into just like our psychological, how we process visuals with our brain. Um, so certain colors are more pleasing to look at. Um, the fact that my glass glowing, it, it glows, it glows orange when it's hot is just visually very like relaxing and pleasing to look at. So I'd say, you know, 50 to 80% of my content falls into that category. Um, in terms of how I'm building out my brand around that, which actually has nothing to do with selling glass or like anything in a business sense, um, I'm basically capturing attention with that. And then I'm able to post art pieces that are like in visually very impressive. Um, and that's a really great way to generate sales for, for me off of the platform. And I've already successfully done that where I'll post, let's say a pendant. So a necklace that's made out of glass. And I'll just post, um, depending on what the necklace looks like, I'll usually have the caption revolve around that. So a good example would be um, if it was a tiger, for example. Um, so like a really cool sculpted tiger, you know, necklace pendant that you're wearing. I'll post it up with a caption of, um, what's your favorite animal? And invariably, because it's so cool and interesting, I'll get at least 10 comments that say, how can I buy this? I want it. Give it to me. It's, it's a almost reverse psychology when you show something to your audience that you know they want, but you don't tell them how to get it. They're going to ask. They're going to go, what is that? How do I get it? Why are you showing it to me? <laughs> um, <laughs> and so that's a really great way to generate sales without ever damaging your, um, like your, your company's ability to communicate and build loyalty with your followers. Because I always feel when you directly sell to your customers, you are hurting your relationship with them in terms of, of really making a connection on a human level. Um, I think that there's a way to sell where you never have to ask for sales because your customers are just knocking your, on your door every day saying, what's new? What do you got for me? On a level, even if you don't have new products where they're just interested to support you on this level to, to give you all their money. Um, and I've experienced that on Instagram with my glass blowing and the way that we kind of um, market our, our, again, big picture brand over just products. Um, and it's allowed us to really tap into that customer desire to support a business and to be a part of a business. So um, I think it's highly effective to kind of bring your customers along on your journey, which is why a, a business story and kind of your business's um, origin story, like you were talking about, can be so amazing, is it's not just explaining to them and giving them context about who you are, it's allowing them to be on the journey with you. And yeah, so, I, I yeah. think uh, not to jump in on, on you too oh, hard yeah, there, but yeah, one of the one of the one of the points that I think is well made is, you know, the entrepreneur's mind is like, how do I get a sale? Right? I got a follower. Right. I want a sale. Right? right? Yeah. And money, but money, the money. follower has <laughs> no interest in that. They're like, how do I, in this case, disconnect from the reality and and just relax and enjoy myself for a minute? Yeah. And we have to respect what the audience wants. Yes. Uh, even as brands. So that means the brand has to build content and build pleasing content in this case and do things that will um, help the audience achieve their goal, not achieve yeah. our goal. And over time, then I agree that there's kind of a, a natural momentum or uh, uh, there's the, what's the principle? Uh, something about, you know, if you do something for other people, then they kind of want to give back to you. Uh, yeah. Reciprocity yeah. principle or whatever it is. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, customers, they think different than the the merchants or the entrepreneurs. Always, right? always, We're, yeah. We are single track minds. I need to sell something today. Who can I sell it to? And instead of saying, you know, what does this look like, as you described earlier, a year from now, two years yeah. from now? And this is the point I want to make to the Oscars out there. Whatever you think about, whether it's TikTok or Snapchat or Instagram or any of them, I think you should be building content that suits that particular audience achieves their goals and then holds back on your goals, right? Later you can figure out how your goals incorporate. doesn't mean you spend tons of money. Uh, my own, you know, pointed out, Hey, we don't all have this giant, uh, war chest. Yeah. I, my understanding is TikTok will allow you to sponsor a hashtag that starts at about $150,000 a day on TikTok. So yeah. anybody who's got the big war chest, go sponsor a hashtag. You'll probably get some followers and, and maybe some interest, but for those of us who don't and need to do that organically, we have to take the more uh, guerrilla marketing tact, if you will. So, uh, Mayan, help us understand from the point you joined TikTok, which you, I think you said around six months ago. Yeah. How did, how did it go from zero to 1.7 million 
I mean, it seems magical. Yeah, it, it, it was absolutely magical. <laughs> um, so it, yeah, it's kind of, you know, even talking about it now, I'm like, did that really actually happen? <laughs> um, so it started out really slow. And when I say really slow, that's probably only because of how fast it's moved now. But compared to Instagram, you know, when I got on the app, immediately my, my videos were getting hundreds um, and then thousands of views, which, you know, now comparatively, I'm not very excited about. But back then, um, you know, Instagram, your views mostly come from your followers. And so if you have 40,000 followers, maybe you're getting 5,000 views on your video um, on average. But I had, you know, starting out zero followers, but even, you know, two weeks into it only had, let's say 600 followers and my videos were averaging several thousand views. And so that really, I was like, how is this working? What's going on? Um, and then two weeks in, I posted a video that was a group of glass blowers making a very, very realistic turtle, a glass turtle. And that blew up and went viral because um, people thought it was a real turtle and they thought that they were like murdering this turtle. <laughs> um, and so there was this comment kind of back and forth controversy of, you know, half the people wanted to, to put in their comment of it's a real turtle. And the other people were like, no, it's not a real turtle. So there was all this back and forth. And then it tapped into a subculture that exists on TikTok um, around something called Visco Girls. And if you don't know what Visco Girls are, that's okay. I still kind of don't know what they are either. <laughs> but it's basically um, like goth or like Hollister Girl or like emo. It's like a style of um, how you would express yourself as, as a person, both kind of, you know, with your clothing and your makeup and different things like that. So Visco Girls, they wear a bunch of colorful scrunchies. They have their hair in a ponytail. Um, they, they have a hydro flask. So they're all about saving the environment. And they're, you know, like metal straws instead of plastic straws to save the turtles. So like save the turtles was a big part of the Visco thing. And because of that, it, it like helped it blow up organically through the app. Um, after that, I had really great timing again with it being the beginning of October, which is um, the lead up to Halloween. And kids in the entire world, but especially younger people go crazy for Halloween, like five times more than they go for Christmas, um, just from my personal observations. And so I naturally thought, okay, what kind of things are associated with Halloween? Because I've always been someone who works based off association. I think with um, businesses, that's a great way to create content in marketing is have associative content. So don't be posted, like let's say you sell jewelry. Um, don't post just the jewelry, post you know, someone wearing the jewelry in a beautiful setting or even kind of do a series of beautiful sunsets or something that is related in the context of they're both beautiful things that make people kind of feel good about themselves. Um, and so I, I posted pumpkins because pumpkins and Halloween, duh. And people just flipped out for these pumpkins in a way I wouldn't have expected. Um, and so that's another thing I actually real quick want to share is there are always really weird pockets of human interest. Um, so I've been researching this a little bit in the past six months. So like with foods, there are particular foods that for some reason people right now are 10 times more interested in. So one of those would be avocados. Avocados as, as a food get, are going to get you 10 times more response than if you post about oranges, even like in a, a blog article title or again, a video, a video of an orange is going to not do as well as a video of an avocado. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, get our fruit scoreboard down, everybody. Yeah, uh, yeah. okay, avocados in the lead. I, I, I tend to agree with you for many of the other subculture reasons, right? The ketos, the other things. Yeah, yeah. So there's always reasons as to why we have kind of these generalized fascinations. Um, but I was able to tap into that, and I posted three or four pumpkin videos that got more than 10 million views each. And oh. on... On TikTok, the way it works, when you have a very viral video, you're going to get a huge influx of new followers because it's showing it to all these people who are loving it at a very high level and therefore want to follow and see more of your content. How do they signal that they love it, that, that it's pleasing? Are there likes so, or loves or yeah, whatever it is? Yeah, it's got the only kind of, you know, actions that you can take on a video would be to heart or like it. Same as on Instagram. Um, and to comment on it, so you can post a comment. So the, the TikTok algorithm is going to take into account how fast you're doing each of these things, not just if you're doing them. Um, but because it's a video, it has a time sequence. Unlike a picture on Instagram, it can't tell 
when you started looking at the picture and how long it's been that you are looking at the picture. On a video, it can tell these things. And so if people are liking the video right away, it knows that it's a more pleasing video than if they're kind of waiting all the way to the end to like it. Same with commenting. Um, I would assume if people are doing longer comments versus shorter comments that it favors that. Um, and the only other thing you can do is share. So you can share to any of the other social apps um, that's natively kind of built into TikTok, which makes it really fun and easy um, to want to use TikTok as your main platform to then share to other platforms. Yeah, so I, I don't think that's a surprise. Very good descriptions uh, that engagement, right, is, is driving. And yeah. not just the quantity, but the pace and the, the you know, speed of engagement. Therefore, I think all of those sites, that probably includes uh, the Snapchats and the, the Instagrams mm -hmm. of the world, find those things. And, and basically, that's the predictor of this, people like it, right? And, right. and yeah. the more people like it, the more they, the platform, TikTok, Instagram, whatever, become the hero to show it to you. Yeah, right? exactly. That's, yeah, that's where the the uh, the flywheel starts turning, so to speak. So, so to me, like I love this story. I, I like this idea that you know glass blowing became a passion, and then you're like, hey, what if I show some pictures of you know glass blowing or some things? Uh, and but I guarantee you, most of the entrepreneurs out there are going, oh, glass blowing's cool. What I do is stupid. That won't work on TikTok. Uh, tell me how we translate something that's cool, like glass blowing, into right. something that is maybe not so cool, like selling sheets or you know lamps or you know. And I kind of know this answer because I've struggled with this, uh, you know, my entire career, thirty years selling stuff that I think are not sexy items. Yeah. But tell me your thoughts of how they can transcend from you know a not cool product into TikTok. Yeah. So I think there's kind of two strategies to do that. One is to just go really, really niche with who you're targeting in terms of, I know these people are looking for my product or service, so I'm gonna make content, even if it's maybe a little bit more boring, really that's perfectly targeted so that when they watch it, they right away go, oh my God, I needed to see this and learn this. Um, the second way, which I think is more fun and you know, maybe more people are interested in is to add the human element. You can add human element to absolutely any business, any product or service, and people are fascinating. Even if you, most of the people listening are going, no, I'm boring. My job's boring. I'm a boring person. I'm not interesting like you. And the fact is that as long as you're not the exact same person as someone else, they will be interested in you just off those differences. We're, we're just fascinated by how people work and why other people think differently than we do and make decisions that are different or the same as, as our decisions. So you can add kind of you know, this human element into your, your content, like for bed sheets, let's say. Do some fun videos where you're playing with the bed sheets or like making a fort out of the bed sheets. Or there's all these different creative ideas. I think that once people allow themselves to step into that space, they'll surprise themselves with what they come up with. Yeah, I think, uh, again, very good advice. And, you know, it's, we shouldn't just, you know, throw something, you know, if you're selling sheets or you're selling uh, knickknacks or whatever, don't put it on a counter, take a picture, or take a video and go, please buy me, right? That's, right. that's not going to work. You need to put some sort of human element into it. And believe it or not, there's all kinds of ways to do it. We had a, a brand um, uh, a number of years back and we actually created, the brand name was Kiasi. We created a bunch of uh, characters for that brand, right? Our, cool. our business yeah. principles were, you know, that were trustworthy. So we had, you know, wow. a trustworthy character yeah. and, our, and we're, our products are tough. So we had a tough character, right? I love that. And we write love the that. stories about these people. And so I, I want the awesomers out there and entrepreneurs to remember that, you know, what we're doing is not just a transaction. That's the part that we can count. That's the, but it's a trailing indicator, right? The transaction is a result of everything that happened upstream. And that includes the planning of the products and the, you know, all the, the work and logistics to get it here and there but it also includes the branding. And this is where I think TikTok has an incredible value is the ability to build a brand, the ability to influence uh, an audience is substantial. And there will be positive ROI if you do it right and you do it over the long term. Don't look at it as a day, you know, one day, you know, I put in money and tomorrow I got to get the money out. Yeah. Also, the money is not that substantial, right? You could create a series of videos probably over the course of a day or two or three, maybe, you know, once a month or whatever, and probably string those uh, throughout the month. Is that a fair thing? You could, you could do such. Yeah. A yeah. Because it, so you actually have an advantage, right? With it being such short video, you could take 
one hour long video, chop up all the good moments or all the 10 second, you know, climactic moments. And then, yeah, spread those out through an entire week or an entire month, really. Yeah, my one hour video would have about two highlights. It's uh, <laughs> the beginning and end. Uh, luckily, you're here to uh, entertain the audience. So, my own, uh, it's uh, been an excellent time talking to you. I want to just uh, point out to the Osmers that Mayan is going to be one of the speakers at the Empowering Women's Conference uh, coming up in Los Angeles. Behind me, you can see the beautiful Manhattan Beach. I, I put that up so there nice. just uh, uh, in honor of that uh, upcoming event. And she's going to be talking about TikTok. And I would say, and again, I'm not uh, stealing your thunder here, but how people use TikTok in business. Is that uh, yes. fair to say? That's the general. Yeah, topic. I'm going to be um, even more specifically target, uh, talking about how online stores, so e-commerce stores and Amazon sellers can really utilize TikTok um, and get in now to kind of set themselves up for a much better business um, experience down the road. I love that. And by the way, I want to just point out for those, uh, again, who may not have put these clues together, a lot of this content that you use on TikTok is going to be usable on Amazon. So Amazon has a bunch of different social things and, and video things coming onto the platform. Cool. And I see a high amount of kind of crossover that you're going to be able to do. Yeah, I think people are, one of the things that TikTok opened my, my kind of mind up to is that with new technologies, it's almost impossible to think about all the applications that they have. Um, just because there's so many businesses out there that are all working towards really similar goals of making their products easier to access, of, you know, integrating more features. And so a lot of these businesses are going to start working together in ways that I think have, have never been, you know, done before, like Amazon integrating social apps. I mean, that's, that's crazy. That's a huge game changer for everyone. Um, and I think that's probably one of, just one of the thing, big things that's going to be happening in terms of, um, Biz, big business partnerships that are going to change the, the landscape of things. Yeah, it's definitely a ton of integration and uh, kind of user experience, you know, collaboration yeah. where it, it feels more seamless. That's certainly the direction it's headed. Uh, Mayan, tell, tell us about the types of things that you do, uh, you know, uh, social media consulting, those types of things. What do you do out there? to? Because some people are going to hear this and go, I like this. This is a great idea. I don't have any idea how to start. Uh, what do you, do you work with yeah, those kind so of people? Uh, absolutely. I, so I, as a social media consultant, um, I kind of target two main groups of people. One are people who know kind of absolutely nothing and want to have a really good understanding after, let's say, one to two hours of time with me. Um, I'm very good at getting across kind of how it works and explaining to people in various different ways so that it makes a lot of sense to them. Um, the second kind of group of people that I typically target are going to be really big businesses or kind of really more complex businesses that understand how important TikTok um, and new emerging technologies are, are going to be to their kind of hold on their market share or place in the industry. Um, so any big business, they don't really need help with their Instagram right now. Like that, that's been around for a while. Same with Facebook. Um, there's, there's lots of kind of tons of information out there on how to be really, really great at that. Um, TikTok has created, though, an opportunity for me to step in with a higher level of expertise and kind of experience than um, the platform has allowed really anyone else to develop because of my previous experience in other social platforms and actual being able to operate through a business on those platforms. Yeah, I love it. Well, I think that's a, a, a nice thing for people to know that there's, a, there's hope out there, even for those of us that either don't have the time or the inclination to do it ourselves. That's um, a big, important thing for us to consider. And I, I would definitely say, you know, I talked about three years ago that messenger bots and chat bots are going to be a big thing and, and very effective thing to help customers have a better experience. And I'm staking uh, my next little uh, prediction that, you know, uh, although I may be a you know, billion and a half people late to the party on TikTok, they, that's how many uh, installs they already have. But TikTok as a effective marketing mechanism will emerge over the next couple of years. And I think it's going to push back Snapchat. Snapchat has been modestly effective, but not highly effective for businesses. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the lasso, which was the Facebook right. attempt to copy TikTok, has about 70,000 downloads versus the 100 or 1 1.5 billion downloads. So the, the score, <laughs> the consumers made the choice. Yeah. The consumers of that content made the choice. TikTok's the winner. And it's, it's actually increasing speed in the United States and Western countries. It's very, very strong in Asia, India, China in particular. Yeah. 
But um, I think the, the Western countries are now, uh, that's the point of inflection that's happening. So uh, thank you, uh, Mayan, for joining us. Uh, thank you for uh, being a speaker, by the way, for the Empowering Women's Conference. That's going to be a, a great thing. I'll put in some links on how people can get tickets. Um, any final words of wisdom you want to care to leave the awesomers with? Just don't see, yeah, look more long-term because when you put in work to any social platform, you're going to learn things that help your business no matter what. Whether you gain followers or you don't gain followers, you will improve your business by paying attention to and kind of testing out different social medias in different ways, just different ways of marketing in general. You'll learn a lot. So don't focus so much on what you're getting right now. Think about where you're going to be in five, 10 years, and you'll have a lot more fun with that kind of attitude as well. <laughs> I, I, do, I do appreciate that. Uh, having fun really is part it, of the it's mission. It's so important. So yeah. important. Uh, being oppressed. Uh, my first 10 years in business was a nightmare. And yeah. I can tell you, when you kind of uh, give yourself a little opportunity to smell the rose and have some fun, it's a good thing. So yeah. Osmers, uh, again, uh, you can go to osmers.com slash 166. You can find today's uh, show notes and details. We, we don't uh, transcribe the thing and uh, you can watch the, the video or listen to the audio. Um, but our, the point of this is to make sure that you have an insight that you didn't previously have. And I will make a prediction that 95% of the Osmers, because I know who they are demographically, do not have TikTok, have never used TikTok, and are terrified about missing the boat on TikTok. So thank you again, Mayan. And uh, we'll see you next time, Osmers. Uh, that's thank a wrap so for today. My pleasure. Thank you.